For as long as the South Carolina Lowcountry can remember, the Murdoch family have always been tied to power and prominence. As the son of three generations of district attorneys, Richard Alexander, or Alec Murdoch, had big shoes to fill. The Murdochs had risen to prominence around 100 years ago, when Randolph Murdoch Sr. created his own law firm and was elected circuit solicitor for the state's 14th district. Then his son was elected, and his son after that, leaving Alec Murdoch with a clear career path. But despite coming from a long list of high-profile lawyers, Alec was described as a loud and frenetic lawyer, able to keep his clients not because of his education or competence, but because he had a charming and persuasive tone, a theme that would come up a lot in later years. For now, let's focus on his family. Alec, the second youngest of four siblings, had met his soon-to-be wife, Margaret, or Maggie Brandstetter, while studying law at the University of South Carolina. Naturally, Alec had joined his family's law firm as soon as he was able to, as it was known to be the best in the region. Sources say they could turn a $100,000 case into a million-dollar settlement. They would send gifts when people graduated, pay for funerals, and visit people who were in the hospital. It's safe to say that their influence in the region ran deep. The Murdochs were basically authority in the Low Country. In 1996 and 1999, the couple had two kids, Buster and Paul Murdoch, both of whom enjoyed the wilderness and shooting at their family's hunting lodge, just outside of town. The family was both loved and feared by the small town of Hampton, but as you'll soon see, members of the Murdoch family were capable of dangerous things. On February 23, 2019, three couples, including Alec's son, Paul Murdoch, gathered at the family's river home to go to what they called an oyster roast, a traditional low country activity where people roast oysters over a fire. Paul, being underage, had used his brother's ID to get alcohol a few hours earlier, and even before the group had started making their way to the oyster roast, Paul, as well as the others, had already started drinking. In fact, Paul was known by his friends to go all out when he drank, usually becoming so drunk that he would become aggressive. But despite being underage, it's said that his parents had facilitated this drinking, sometimes giving him alcohol or letting him drink with them. Nevertheless, after meeting up, the friends took the boat and started making their way to the oyster roast. In a deposition later given by one of the people on the boat that night, the decision to take the boat was to avoid the police that would be on the roads during the night, since they were drinking underage. They hung out and promptly left around midnight, but it's said that Paul and Connor Cook, one of Paul's friends, had wanted to make a stop at a bar before heading home. The rest of the group had voiced their objections about the plan. It was getting cold and late, and most just wanted to go home. But Paul had allegedly said that he was going to get a shot no matter what. So around 1am, the group arrived at Luther's bar, where Connor and Paul walked into the bar and consumed even more alcohol while the others waited for him. His friends later recounted that Paul became out of his mind drunk. But despite that, Paul had still wanted to drive the boat home, and no matter how much his friends had objected or suggested alternatives, Paul is said to have been stubborn that night. And so, the group started boating their way back home. We were just leaving, we weren't going fast at all, but then it got to the point where we were going in circles and weren't going anywhere, and everyone started to argue with Paul because he wouldn't let anyone else drive, and I was annoyed because I had to work the next day, and everyone else wanted to get home, so it caused a lot of arguments. But at this point, Paul had started acting erratically, speeding up the boat and not letting anyone else steer. He just got very mouthy with everybody. I yelled at him once and he just told me to shut the F up and sit the F down. Nobody else is driving my boat. And as tension and fear grew among the group, the boat had accelerated into a piling under the Archer's Creek Bridge, throwing most off the boat and into the water. In minutes, despite the strong current, most could swim their way up to shore. But when they did, they quickly realized that someone was missing. 19-year-old Mallory Beach, girlfriend of Anthony Cook, was nowhere to be found. Upon this realization, they quickly called 911. What bridge is it? Paul, what bridge is this? Paul, what bridge? 911, where's your emergency? Hello? Police fire, any of Hello? We're in a boat crash on Archer Street. Where where about on Archer Street? In Archer Street, the only bridge on Archer Street. Archer Street? Archer's Creek. You okay. And then well who's that in the background? There's there's six of us and one is missing. Okay. There's six, but one is missing. 
So six, do you guys they have life jackets on? Yes, ma'am. We have we have more than enough life jackets, but we're on the bank. So you missing? Who's missing? Uh, female Mallory B is missing. Okay. Where? At this point, police had started to show up. So we got five, six total, five accounted for. Yes, sir. Okay. They were going out, and they, they were running this way when they hit the bridge, so she probably got ejected and the current carrier carried her down that way. Listen, man, my mom works for Slade. Okay, listen, all right, that's my cool. mom works for Slade. I told you you're not in trouble. Right. I ain't Do you want to call that. that? I need Did to call, call her. I need to call her. I said, there's 50 cops out here, and one of the cops was nice enough to let me call you. Mom, there's 50 cops here, Coast Guard, everything. We can't find Mallory. It's been 30 minutes, Mom. Hey, Rose, you want this? Get that motherfucker right there away from me. You talking about that one with no shirt on? Bro, you fucking smiling like you're fucking funny. My fucking girlfriend gone, bro. Do you think it's fucking funny? Sit down, sit down, sit down. And that's when it was going way too fast. I don't even know. I finally got to the point I grabbed my girlfriend and put her in my lap in the bottom of the boat and was holding on with my eyes closed. The next thing I know, I'm in the fucking water. I can't find it, man. Yeah. Y'all know Alec Murdoch? Oh, yeah, I know that name. That's his son. That's so driving the boat. Good luck. But hours went by and Mallory was nowhere to be found, kicking off a search and rescue mission for local police and volunteers. For eight days, dive teams, rescue boats, and helicopters went looking for Mallory, considering it a rescue mission. Until, on March 3rd, around 10 days after the initial crash, Mallory was found by volunteers around 8 kilometers downstream, deceased. According to officials, she died from drowning in blunt force trauma. Later, Paul was charged in court with three felony charges related to the death of Mallory, but was released on a $50,000 bail while awaiting trial. Many say that this is when the downfall of the Murdoch family had started. After discovering that Mallory was killed because of Paul's recklessness, many turned against Paul for his excessive drinking and his parents for their negligence. Depositions from various people on the boat that night seemed to incriminate Paul even more. A nurse who treated some of the injured had also said that Paul had been cursing, demanding, and had an attitude while at the hospital. And the public had started to notice the preferential treatment Paul was getting in court. He wasn't handcuffed or processed in a detention center. He wasn't given a sobriety test the night of the crash. He wasn't required to wear an ankle monitor or even barred from driving a boat again. At this point, the public was starting to lose respect for the Murdochs. But in 2021, things would change once again. Alec Murdoch, as previously mentioned, had joined his family's law firm, PMPED, as soon as he was able to. His colleagues weren't particularly confident in his professional abilities, but he was always someone that was seen as trustworthy and charming. That's why, when the company's CFO found clues that Murdoch might be stealing client settlement money, she brushed it off as another one of Murdoch's sloppy habits. In reality, Alec Murdoch had opened an account at the Bank of America and called it Forge. So, unbeknownst to the company, instead of sending clients settlement money to the legitimate company, Forge Consulting, as they would usually do, Murdoch would take the checks and deposit them into his own bank account. By June 2021, the company CFO became more and more sure that Murdoch was stealing from the company. And so, on June 7th, 2021, they went to confront Alec about the suspicious activity. 
But that night, something happened. It's secure. Got a whiskey fox, whiskey mic, both gunshot wounds to the head. Sir, I want to let you know because of the scene, I do. I did go get a gun and bring okay. it down here. It's in your vehicle. It, I just you have any guns on you at all? Leaning, no, sir. It's leaning okay. up against the side of my car. Okay. You're you're fine, man. You're fine. Turn around for me. On the night of June 7th, 2021, Alec Murdoch had said that when he came home from visiting his mother, he'd stumbled upon his wife, Maggie, and his son, Paul Murdoch, dead with gunshot wounds, at which point he'd called the police. This is the firearm you brought from inside the house? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I went and get... This is a long story. My son was in a boat wreck a, a few months back. He's okay. been getting threats. Most of it's been benign stuff we didn't take serious. Okay. Um, you know, he, he's been getting, like, punched. <laughs> um, I know that's somebody, I know that's what it is. Okay. <laughs> How did you pull up you, from back there? I, came, I went to the house, and they weren't home, which was odd. I tried to call. Okay. And then I knew they had been down here before I left to go to my mom's. Okay. And so, I, that is loaded. Okay. Um, you might want to unload it. They are dead, aren't they? Yeah, yes, sir. That's what it. That's what it looks like. <laughs> At around 1 a.m., police started asking Alec what happened. Just start the top. Take your time. Um. Like when I came back here, mm -hmm. I mean, I pulled up and I could see him and, you know, I knew something was bad. I ran out. I knew it was really bad. <laughs> my, my boy over there, I could see it was. And I could see his brain on his... <laughs> And I ran over to Maggie and uh, actually I think I tried to turn Paul over first. Um uh, you know, I tried to turn him over and uh I don't know, I figured it out. Um Paul was found near dog kennels, face down, with two shotgun wounds. One shot that grazed his chest and went through his left arm, and another that entered through his neck and exited through the back of his head. Maggie was found a few feet away with five assault rifle wounds. Uh, I mean, I could see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have y'all been having any problems out here? Trespassers? None people that I, breaking in? None that I know of. The only thing... That what comes to my mind is my son Paul was in a boat wreck uh, a couple years ago, mm -hmm. and there's been a, you know, he was charged with being uh, arrested for being the driver. There's been a lot of negative publicity about that, and there's been a lot of people online just really vile stuff. But when it was evident that a double murder had taken place, but there was no vehicle, no murder weapon found, or even a suspect description. Investigators, more specifically the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division, or SLED, was tasked with making sense of all the evidence and clues. And that started with asking Alec Murdoch his whereabouts during that day. During an interview three days after the murders, Alec had said that he'd started the day at work, before coming home a bit earlier than usual, and then hanging out with his son, Paul. For, you know, just doing things we like to do out there. Okay. You know, we're riding around looking at food plots, looking, you know... We, Look, looking for hogs. The family then ate dinner, and Maggie and Paul went to the dock kennels while Alex stayed behind. Um, and what did you do once once Maggie and Paul left? I stayed in the house. Okay. And I was watching TV, looking at my phone, and I actually fell asleep on the couch. Okay. After waking up, Alex said that he went to his mother's house, around a 30-minute drive, before leaving and coming back. All right, so where are we? All right, so you, then you, I you left, left your my mom's, mom's and making phone calls. I left my mom's and I, I went back home. I got to the house. Uh, I went inside. Nobody was there. I got in the car. 
I went back to the kennels and, you know. A big piece of information early on in the investigation was that Paul Murdoch had been getting threats related to the Mallory Beach boat crash. How would he receive most of those threats? What do you mean? I mean, would, would people call and hang up on them or no, send them texts no, or it wasn't social so much media? That. No, it was, it was mostly like in-person confrontations or the ones that I learned about. Now, I suspect his friends can probably tell you about mm-hmm. more because I doubt Paul told me about all of them. Okay. But I knew about a lot of them. You know, there were a lot of times where people would come up to him and he'd be like, they'd say something about, you know, you're going to tell me who was driving that boat or you you little piece of shit were you driving that boat you know stuff at this point the murdoch's family law firm now positive that alec had been stealing money from clients forced him to resign back in the investigation sled had been interviewing anyone who had a connection to the family especially those who had a connection to the boat crash but months had gone by and sled still hadn't arrested anyone and with the sheer lack of information about the case the public was getting restless but not before the case takes another unhinged twist. Around three months after the murders, Alec Murdoch calls 911 again. Hampton County 911, what is your emergency? On um, Sockahatchee Road. Okay, what's the address on Sockahatchee Road? I'm by the church. Uh, what church? Here? Uh, In the call, he says that while trying to change a flat tire on the side of a road, a car had slowed down as if they were going to help him, but tried to shoot him instead. He was airlifted to a hospital and treated for a superficial gunshot wound, but recovered fully. This incident sparked debates over what enemies the Murdoch family might have made since the boat crash in 2019. After all, there had been swirling suspicions about what role Alec himself had to play in the deaths of his wife and son, but before that could be answered, it was revealed that the person who tried to shoot Alec was a former client of his, 61-year-old Curtis Edward Smith. But in a bizarre turn of events, it was also revealed that Alec had asked Smith to kill him, a sort of botched suicide for hire scheme. Alec had believed that if he died, then his sole surviving son, Buster Murdoch, could collect $10 million in insurance payments. Around this time, something that was gaining more attention was Alec's apparent addiction to opioids. According to statements from his attorneys, Alec had tried to get through the deaths of his wife and son by using opioids and oxycodone. But when he had tried to quit, he'd been launched into a severe depression and decided to end his life. He was in a massive depression, realized that things were going to get very, very, very bad, um, and he decided to end his life. He believed that $10 million policy had a suicide exclusion. Suicide exclusions are only good for two years, and he didn't realize that, so he arranged to have this guy shoot him. Now, what's amazing? Eventually, Alec, as well as the client he'd hired, was arrested and charged with crimes relating to the plot. Alec was, of course, released on bond, but with this, the public's opinion on the murders that had happened a few months earlier had changed. Okay, so let's talk about Megan and Paul here, Dick, because your, your client lied about the circumstances under which he was shot. It, it wouldn't be a stretch for folks to think that he probably also lied about the circumstances under which his wife and son were shot. Well, that, that uh, and I, look, I've spent the last year and a half with Maggie and Paul and Alec. I represented Paul on the boat case, um, met with them dozens of times. Uh, they were very affectionate. They, they... That's why, around a month later, in October 2021, Sled revealed that Alec Murdoch was a person of interest in the murders of his own wife and son. But upon focusing their efforts on Alec, Sled discovered that his track record wasn't as clean as he'd portrayed, so much so that he was arrested that same month on new charges. Around three years prior to the murders, in 2018, the Murdoch's housekeeper, Gloria Satterfield, had tripped and fell on the stairs of their house, later dying because of her injuries. Alec had lied about the circumstances around her death, saying that his dogs had tripped her to fraudulently obtain an insurance payout. And instead of giving the nearly $4 million payout to Satterfield's sons, he pocketed it and told them that a settlement hadn't been reached. These charges, however, were enough to keep Alec in jail, having been denied bond twice. Later, his bond would be set at $7 million. However, all these new charges that Alec had received didn't take the public's attention away from the murders in 2021. Instead, it magnified his role in them. 
That's why, in July 2022, just over a year after the murders, Alec would be arrested and indicted for the murders of his wife and son, to which he pleaded not guilty. The trial began six months later, in January 2023. First to take the stand were the first responders that came onto the scene, where the defendant, Alec's team, made it clear that police could have contaminated evidence on the crime scene, which in turn could have incriminated an innocent person. The shot was made where he basically standing, correct? That, in that area? Where we are all standing? Yes. Yes, sir. Is that procedure to walk around on top of an area where shots have been fired? It, perhaps, and I think even in this they're talking about tissue or brain matter laying there. Um, I mean, aren't you supposed to? You don't put anything on your feet. But the most damning piece of evidence incriminating Alec Murdoch was a Snapchat video that Paul had taken only a few minutes before his and his mother's murder. Get back. Get back. Quit, Cash. Come. Quit. That's okay. Come here. Come here, Cash. Shit. Come here. Post it. Get it. Hey, he's got a bird in his mouth. Bubba. Hey, Bubba. That's a guinea. This is a chicken. Come here, Bubba. Come here, Cash. Come here, Bubba. Cash. Quit. Alec had always insisted that he had gone to his mother's house the night of the murders and came back to see that his son and wife had been killed. But the video shows that Alec was still there minutes before the murder, meaning he'd lied in multiple police interviews. Mr. Murdoch, is that you? On the kennel video at 8.44 p.m. on June 7th, the night Maddie, Maggie and Paul were murdered. It is. Were you in fact at the kennels at 8.44 p.m. on the night Maggie and Paul were murdered? I was. Did you lie to Sled Agent Owen and Deputy Laura Rutland on the night of June 7th and told them that you stayed at the house after dinner? I did lie to them. Alec, why did you lie to Agent Owen, Agent Croft, and Deputy Rutland about the last time you saw Maggie and Paul? As my addiction evolved over time, I would get in these situations or circumstances where I would get paranoid thinking. Uh, it, and it, it could be anything that, that triggered it. It might be a look somebody gave me. It might be a reaction somebody had to something I did. Um, it might be a policeman following me in, in a car. Um, that night, June 7th, don't talk to anybody without Danny with you. So all my partners were just repeatedly telling me that. I had a deputy sheriff taking gunshot test from my hands. And all those things coupled together after finding them, coupled with my distrust for SLED, caused me to have paranoid thoughts. Former colleagues of Alec were also called to testify about his financial situation. So the next thing that happened was on Monday, May, on June 7th, went to look for Alec, and when I got upstairs, he was standing outside of his office, leaning on a file cabinet. And he looked at me with a, a pretty dirty look, one I'd not seen before, and said, what do you need now? Um, clearly disgusted with me, which kind of raised my hackles. So I said, well, let's go in your office and talk about it. When we went in his office, I said, I told him, I said, I have reason to believe that you received the fairest money directly to you and you need to prove to me that you did not. And um, he assured me again that the money was in there. I told him I still needed to see. The prosecution ended their case by saying that Alec had murdered his wife and son because of a combination of stresses in his life. His addiction to opioids and attempt to distract and delay the investigations into his financial problems, among other things. The pressures on this man were unbearable and they were all reaching a crescendo the day his wife and son were murdered by him. All on that day. And in the wake of this, everything changes. People stop 
asking about these things. The community has changed like you would expect. People are concerned, they're scared, they're worried. And everything's changed. The backlash from the boat case has gone away and all of that has changed. However, experts also testified that the bullet trajectories show that a short person had fired the shots and Alec Murdoch is 6'4". One big question in the case was why Alec didn't have any blood on his shirt, shoes, or even shorts. Did you see what appeared to be blood on Alex Murdoch's hands? I did not. On his arm? No. On his shirt? None. On his shorts? No. On his shoes? I did not. Some had said that this is proof that he couldn't have been the murderer, while others have said that he could have changed his clothes, but police have never found any of Alex's clothes that are drenched in blood. Eventually, on March 2nd, 2023, a little under two years after the murders, Alec was found guilty on two counts of murder and two more on possession of a weapon during a violent crime. In the murder of your wife, Maggie Murdoch, I sentence you for a term of the rest of your natural life for the murder of Paul Murdoch. With Alex sentenced to life in prison and his crimes unfolding the way that they did, the Murdoch family's fall from grace was one in slow motion, with one crime being revealed after another, magnifying his role in the deaths of his wife and son. What was odd about this case, though, was the lack of incriminating evidence found at the crime scene itself, and how Alec was able to fly under the radar for months before he was arrested. For now, Alec stays at the McCormick Correctional Institute in South Carolina.